dark. It's raining. Sails are gusting in the flapping winds. You're standing braced against the railing, peering out into the darkness, watching, searching for the breaking of the waves. All the signs, the birds, and the currents point to land being near, but you hope you don't find it before dawn. Unlike Captain Cook and the early explorers, we have the luxury of knowing more about our planet. We have maps. Captain Cook and the early explorers inspired me. I looked at their courage or their insanity and was absolutely fascinated. At a certain point in history, all we knew about the world was contained in a handful of drawings in the minds of a few people. These people pushed back the frontier. They looked at every frontier as a wall, or as a, sorry, they looked at every frontier as a door and not a wall. They pushed it back. They uncovered great truths, and best of all, they left a record for us to follow. A cartographer is a storyteller, and that's what I've been doing for 20 years. And we tell a specific kind of story. In the beginning, sorry, we tell a specific kind of story. Now, the truth is that you all make maps, even if it's just in your own heads. Maps give us context, maps take us places. Maps have existed since before the written word. I'm also a software developer, and I often think I was born at the perfect time. This is a time when I've had the opportunity to travel, I've had to work with some truly, truly visionary people on some really exciting projects. This is a time when location-aware software, mapping, and hardware are coming together. This is a time when we can make old things new and new things better. At a certain point in time, we actually, you know, a certain group of companies came out with maps and they were online and they were interactive and honestly, we all thought we were going to be out of a job. And I would be sitting on a beach someplace, you know, relaxing. Uh, <laughs> the truth is this only raised my clients' expectations. And with the raising in expectations plus the advance of technology, our ability to tell stories just got better and better. And that's what I'm here to share with you. Some of these incredible projects that we've been working on. Projects like this. This is a project that looks a lot like Google Street View, but it's actually of the coastline of Alaska, specifically the Cook Inlet. It has over 20,000 hours, of, or sorry, 20,000 high definition photos and over 90 hours of video. I worked with an incredible team on this. First of all, it was flown. And the helicopter team, there was a biologist on one ear that would speak in a speaker, and in the other ear, you had a geomorphologist. So they flew for 90 hours around Cook Inlet and were speaking the whole time. So you got this whole story of what was happening on the ground. And then my team took that information and put it into this mapping program. You can see where the helicopter is. And we would follow it around and compress it all so we could get it on the screen for Coastal, coastal responder or first responders and coastal managers to use in case of a disaster. And this project here, it looks a lot like Google Earth, but it's incredibly, incredibly detailed. And you can actually turn on and off the buildings. It's used by university planners. It's a huge campus. It's used by university planners, directors, and students so they can actually build a more sustainable environment. They can see how this whole environment's gonna grow into the future. It's absolutely amazing. And then we have things like this. This is an augmented environment of an airport. Now what we've done here is we've taken those 3D models, but we've joined them in with an iPad. So it's merged the 3D model with the real world. And as you move the iPad around, you can actually see the world change. You can see into the future. Incredibly valuable for stakeholders, incredibly valuable for any decision makers to actually be able to stand there and look at something and see what it's going to look like next year, the year after, the year after that. Or more interestingly for me, often it's what did it look like when we did this project? 
What's, what's it going to look like? You know, when people look back on it, what's it going to look like? What did it look like? But something was always lacking in this. Clients kept on asking us for more live data. And live data comes from continually updating sor sources, constantly adding valuable information to our story. Live data comes from things like trackers on planes, trains, ships. It also comes from things like social media. There's over a billion posts every day in social media. A billion posts every day that get put up on social media. Now only some of these are publicly available and only some of them are geotagged. That's the only ones that I can work with. That really comes down to about 82 million pieces of data every day that are mappable, 82 million pieces. So I have a really smart team that I work with, a bunch of master students. We thought we'd throw together a prototype map. And this was one of our very early prototype maps with the, with the team. All we did was simply draw a box over an area and it came back with all the live data from that location. And the results are actually pretty incredible. And this is my neighborhood. You know, these are the thoughts, pictures, news, things that people thought were interesting that they posted up online. This gives me a new way to view this kind of information. You could always go onto Twitter, you can always go onto these sites and see this information yourself if you were, if you were signed up for it. But this gives me a new way to view it all in context of this space, a new way to see what's happening on the ground. Essentially, it's a new search engine a new way to look at the world. And res the results are really fascinating. It can also be hugely practical. This is Tacloban in the Philippines during and after the cyclone that hit. Now Tacloban is, it, it was horrendous. Everybody had left the city, but even without the social media in that area that was live, we went back through the historic data. And we were actually able to figure out by just looking at the location's popularity, how many people had checked in, stuff like that, we were actually able to figure out where the most popular restaurants were, where the most popular pharmacies were, giving first responders an idea of where they might be able to find medicine, drugs, that kind of thing. It's things that are critical to people that are first on the ground. And we're being used in places like this. This is in Africa. And maps like ours are being used in places like this so that if people take pictures of endangered species by accident, we can just simply go over and ask them to take it off so that the poachers won't be able to find it. And this incredibly important stuff. I also use it every day to watch what's going on in the world. These are pictures from Kiev uh, at the start of the revolution, from the square, the independent square where it all started. We were literally watching this days before it ever made the news, over here anyway, days before it ever made the news. The national news took a while to catch up to what was going on on the ground. We were watching it grow and spread from independent square all the way across the country. We were watching this live. As things were being posted, we were actually able to see that come up instantly on the screen. So when things are happening, they're happening in real time. We're able to see it instantly. It's coming up. We were able to watch tanks like these travel from Russia down into the Crimean Peninsula. We were able to watch things like this. This is actually a soldier. He's taken down his photos now. But at one time, you could watch him move from Russia all the way into the Ukraine, which at the time was the earliest indication that Russians were actually participating in the conflict. And this was incredibly important. We didn't realize how important it was at the time. When we, ha when we saw this going on, we were just, you know, it's, it's somebody that was just, we're just looking, we're watching, we're witnessing him post these things. 
he actually made it onto national news. Um, and I think he's now back in, in Russia, but he actually made it on national news and now his account has been locked, so who knows what happened. <laughs> And while this was going on, Venezuela was also going on. Now, Venezuela had over 6,000 conflicts in the first six months of last year. 6,000. Political demonstrations, protests, all this stuff was going on. Most people weren't even aware of what was happening. It certainly wasn't, we didn't have a clue of what was going on, uh, really from my news, where I'm at. Um, what I saw, though, when I went over areas like this, is that everybody was participating in this kind of conflict. It's a very passionate conflict. All the social media from that area is very different than the type of social media you get from the Ukraine, for, for instance. And while that was going on, Thailand was also going on, and I don't think it got a lot of attention. And it didn't get a lot of attention, but the entire Bangkok was shut down. Uh, I, it, was, it was an amazing thing to watch. Um, huge number of people, it was all completely, huge protests happening in the middle of the city. Now, what struck me the most, of course, is that these three conflicts were happening simultaneously, but it was really the Ukraine that was dominating my national news. And I don't think it's a conspiracy, I just don't think that modern news agencies have the bandwidth to cover the globe like software like this can. I've used this software to go places I never expected to go. I've used this software to go places like Chernobyl. I had no idea that I'd find this much social media from Chernobyl. No idea at all. It's actually mostly of pictures of plants growing up through trees, um, you know, uh, or sorry, plants growing up through houses, um, you know, animals taking over houses and living in them and so on. It's, it's an incredible place to go and visit through the eyes of social media. And I also go to places like North Korea. North Korea I find fascinating. <laughs> North Korea is one of those really, really interesting places. Never expected to actually find this much social media in North Korea. Hands up, who knew that North Korea had a water park? <laughs> Anybody? <laughs> North Korea has a water park. When I first went to North Korea, I didn't know what to expect, but I certainly did not expect to see the faces of their citizens. I certainly did not expect um, you know, to see what I've actually seen. I, we ran into Dennis Rodman in a hotel in the middle of uh, the capital city of, of, of North Korea, um, taking a selfie with somebody. Um, <laughs> I certainly did not expect to see pictures of their kids. I didn't expect to see pictures of them walking to work. All my life, I've grown up with North Korea being behind a wall. All my life, I've grown up with North Korea being a general and a bunch of people in military uniforms sitting around a table. That's my view of North Korea, or was my view of North Korea. And I've got to say, I've never expected to be working on a software program that actually changed the way that I thought about the world. And this is Ferguson. I mean, lots of stories that I'm telling you right now, you're probably unfamiliar with. This one I hope you're, you're familiar with. This is Ferguson, Missouri. Really interesting here, and I pulled this one out because if you look in the background, just about everybody is holding up a camera. Just about everybody is taking a picture of what's going on. They're very, very aware that they're bearing witness to what's happening on the ground, and they're actually telling their story online. This just gives us a great way to view this kind of story. It gets us right in place, right, right exactly at that time, and shows us the information coming back. So where will this go? Social media is not going to go away. Social media is something that we have to become educated about. Social media is something that we're going to, or all dynamic data, I should say, is something we're going to have to get used to, something we're going to have to be able to adapt to, something that we're going to have to be able to use. I can actually see a point in time where applications like the one I was showing you become an engine, an engine that guides you, an engine that shows you, you know, where your favorite restaurants are, and it all comes up on a single interface. It can be on your Google Glass, it can be on your watch, it can be on your smartphone, it doesn't really matter. Um, you'll see where your friends are at, you'll see where the nearest bathroom is, things like that. What I'd like to see, I'd love to see museums. Now, I'd love to see museums and private collections scan their artifacts and put them actually back where they were taken from. 
I live on the west coast of Canada. I have two kids. I would love to have my kids go out and look at the First Nations artifacts that have been removed, put back at least virtually where they belong. Can you imagine what that would do for education? Can you imagine how much that would shape the world? I'm very thankful to be living on that land and I think it would lead to a direct connection that we currently don't have. So, a conflict's happening. There's a time, or I should say, you know, it's a convergence, I should say, where mapping, software, hardware, and the real world are coming together, which is going to allow us to tell better stories. It's going to allow us to explore places that we never thought possible. Hopefully, it'll bring down walls. Hopefully, it'll strengthen all of our connections. This TEDx celebrates pioneers. Modern day Captain Cooks. Pioneers that tell stories, pioneers that read stories, pioneers of the imagination. I'm thankful to be here. Thank you very much.